big shit, big shit, big shit, big shit. Huh. It's a unique hustle, nigga. Big shit, big shit, big shit, big shit. Huh. Name another podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. There's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing official Miss Jamaica. How you doing? Not nothing all gone. Man, hey man, God bless us with a jewel today, man. I know. Man, we having a fun time in New Orleans. Exactly. Fun, fun, fun. We only been down here three times, right? This is yes. the third time. Mm-hmm. And nineteen this, and years, three times. We've been together nineteen years. And you know years. what? I think this is the longest we've stayed in New Orleans. Because we every always time, go to Atlanta or something. Yeah, every time we've been to New Orleans, we always stay here. For a day. Here. Mac is here, man. <laughs> we in New Orleans, man. In New Orleans in the to Big Easy. <laughs> oh, and happy anniversary. Thank happy you, man. Thank we you. we doing Thank it, man. We, hey, we, we, it wasn't easy. Let me give my... Uh, it got my, it ups and downs. Let, let me give my speech. You know okay, what I'm go saying? ahead. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy? No, but you know, because... It, it of, wasn't the Big Easy? No, it wasn't. Oh, okay. It was me mostly, you know, just sacrificing and, you know, uh, doing you the just, things. Just wait, 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 wait. Hold just hold you on. sacrificing. I know. That's what oh. I was... That's, that's what I was just about to say. I was going like, what? I mean, you got to understand, man. America... <laughs> you, didn't just, you didn't just hear that, America. No, nah, I got to give it to him, man. Just, no, nah, I'm blessed to have you. So I understand that. And I, I and, and I know you put up with me. It was hard. Yeah. <laughs> so I cleaned it up good, you right? You see how he cleaned it up. Max, yeah, yeah. so, man, what's going America, on, man? He cleaned it up. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on, man? Just give us a spiel, man. Like, man, you've been... You be, you've been through so much. You done done so much, man. Um, but before you get into spill, no, no, no. I want to know. Let's go back before the spill starts. Okay. Okay. Let's go back. That Are was you a spill? born? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> born and raised here. Yes, born and raised um, uptown New Orleans. Uptown New Orleans. How was that for you? Um, it's a that's a very good question. First of all. Uptown was it was very live. It was it was a lot of life. It was a lot of love. You know, it was it was dangerous at times, but for the most part, my childhood and upbringing was it was pretty fun. It was dope. Siblings, yeah, brothers, sisters. Well, I'm the oldest of six, so oldest of six. I was the leader of the pack, and I I didn't really have a choice. So So a lot fell on your shoulders. Yeah, a lot always fell on my shoulders. How was it being a leader? Because you know. Okay, were you a leader where you... Because, you know, as a kid, you just do your thing. You're not thinking about, I have these siblings actually looking up to me, and if I do this, they're going to follow. Right. How were you as that leader? Well, I I didn't have the luxury of not knowing that they would follow. Like, my parents made sure I understood okay. that you was the leader of the pack, and everything you do is going to affect the way your siblings see it and the yeah. way they That's view the good. world. So, um, it was... It was great that they trusted me with that type of responsibility, responsibility. but um it came with a heavy a heavy weight so mm-hmm. for a child it was like oh man so i kind of a lot of times i just always when things didn't work out i just kind of felt you know like i i like let everybody down everybody. yeah wow and you were right because it sounded like your dad and your mom was in the household yeah, my parents are actually still married today. They, they've awesome. been married now for 45 years. This year, this November will make 46 years. Wow, married. that's a blessing. Yeah, because since we started blessing. this show and interviewing a lot of people, not a lot of people have that luxury man, at all. that's a blessing. I can tell you for a fact it is because everybody we get on the panel be like, nah, my mom and dad, they're they not together. Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> See, that's why, that's why I was like... Uh, what you mean? You don't want to sacrifice it. <laughs> Mom's had to do a lot of nah, sacrifice. Nah, man, I know it. I will just give it. I know it. I know you was joking. Yeah, did. they've been together now for almost forty six years. That's wow. a long time, and that's that's something that instills something in you as well. Mm-hmm. To see that, you have to stand on that as a as a as a. As a uh, 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 as as a child, as that being your mom and dad, you right. being in relationships, it means something. Mm-hmm. Like like because you don't look at it the same, right? You can't because you know it's serious business. Because you would grew up seeing you grew up seeing that, right? Right. So that's that's the difference. But you don't pay attention to it. But I mean, you know, just no, getting back to no, it. No, what I was saying is, um, so but then when you when you're a child and you see your parents, you know, having ups and downs or in the same household, you're not thinking about it. You don't think about it till you are grown and you have to deal right. with your own relationship or you have to deal with your whole own. Cause I remember when I got married, I, I called my mom. I was like, mom, I don't know how you balanced all of this. Wow. Children having time for yourself and then finding time for your husband. And I mean, it's, it, it's a challenge every day to find time to make everybody right. happy. Plus also take care of yourself. Right. Yeah. 
It very much is a challenging. They make it parents make it look really easy. Let's get down to the nuts and bolts, and, and it just looks that way. It just looks cause, that cause way. I'm, I'm, I mean, I feel that any relationship, a relationship itself, is a sacrifice because you have to sacrifice a part of yourself to, um, I guess you would say, mend with someone else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when I when I look at. Uh, you going over there? Okay. When when I look at uh, just coming up in New Orleans, how was it? Far we gonna get on the music a little bit, like No Limit, uh, that movement when it first took off. How how did how was it for you? Okay. Well, the strange thing is I had already been professionally recording records before I, before No Limit came about. Okay. Like I, my first album came out when I was twelve. That was like wow. nineteen eighty nine. And I was introduced to the music industry by Gregory D and Manny Fresh, who were a local group in New Orleans at the time. And um, by the time I um, linked with No Limit, or by the time the No Limit uh, movement had, had, had started, like right around that time that it was on the verge of, of blowing up, I was um, probably at that period in my life where I was like, Yo, I, something has to happen. Something has to happen. So um, I had a few offers from a couple of different record labels. And um, how old were you when you met them? When I met when, when you when you when this no started limit. happening for you, I was about nineteen. I was just trying to you know. So yeah. you had already who put you in the music at twelve? Well, um, like I, I, as I mentioned, Greg, uh, a guy named Gregory D from New Orleans put um, a record out in nineteen eighty six. Uh, it was Gregory D and Sporty T. They were in a group called the Ninja Crew. The Ninja Crew actually split up around 87, and Gregory D found a DJ from the Seventh Ward named Manny Fresh. Got it. And they linked up. There you and, go. And uh, Greg told me that, um, he told me from day one, he said, Lil Mac, when I get on, I got you. And um, he came, got me. And I was like 11 years old, and they produced, him and Manny Fresh produced my first record, and it was released in 1989. So I was called, uh, the name of the album was The Lyrical Midget. Wow, and and so do you still got you still got that music? I can still find that music. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. That's and real. and so that was the young Manny Fresh. I always yeah. thought it was different phases of Manny Fresh anyway. So that just it answers questions for me. Right. In fact, if you look at the video, I had a video out back then called "I Need Wheels." Manny is actually sitting right behind me. Oh yeah. And, um, we were on the, the streetcar on the trolley in the video, and you'll get to see a young man at fresh with like the high top fade and everything. How, how was that like back then producing music uh, and just basically putting out music during that time with Manny Fresh? Like how was that? Well, it was working. Great. With, it was working a learning. With him, you know? It was a learning experience for me. Like Manny actually taught me how to arrange my songs in uh, what I would call song mode because before meeting Manny I just used to my raps were like large run on paragraphs and uh, Manny was like nah Lil Mac you gotta break it down into uh, 16 bars and then 8 bars for the hook and so he kind of coached me on how to uh, arrange the songs that is something. and watching him do beats eventually made me wanna you know when he was probably outside of something because we used to record in his bedroom so when he was outside I would sneak and go plug his equipment up and try to tap on the buttons so I could learn how to make beats and eventually he sat down and showed me how to do it because he knew if not I was going to break his equipment because I was a kid <laughs> he was like 20 19, 20 I was like 12 and he yeah. just knew that I was a kind of a a mischievous and stubborn kid who uh, was going to do what I wanted to do wow so I mean so when you when you once you start to link into the music now let's go on up to 19 now like like the part where now the no limit phase starts. okay you got to make a choice so manny fresh name was around then because i know kl always tell me the story about he met baby before manny and he met baby and manny before they knew each other right you know and and stuff like that so i understand that being, being that you guys are in 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 new orleans this kind of stuff is going to happen but for you like you were seeing the music. You was turned on to it early. Manny didn't do the no limit thing. How did that? How did that kind of? You know what I mean? Right. Split out. Well, Manny had already um, been with Cash Money before okay. he um, before No Limit had before Mo Lim No Limit had um, had got really out there. Okay. Manny was already with Cash Money, and in fact, I was 
um, courting Cash Money at the time. Okay. Uh, and I used the word courting because I was hanging around. I did a song with BG, and I was just trying to get in. Yeah. And, you know, it was it was I was just trying to get in, get in where I fit in. And um, where is this song at with BG? That's my. It's guy. on Chopper City on the first. Uh, I got to go Chopper City. It's called Niggas in Trouble. All right. So we were, um, you know, we were, we we talked to them, and I was signed to a record label at the time called Ionic. And I was with um, a good friend of mine named Storm, and we were we were recording an album and getting ready to release it, and I, something just kind of fell with the record label, and um, I was just looking for a new spot, a new home to go to actually record, and um, I met Cain and Abel, and um, started hanging with them because they were they were releasing yeah, music them. at the time yeah. under the name Double Vision, yeah, and so I was hanging with them, and I knew Fiend, you know, all of us. With the exception of Cain and Abel, but a lot of us kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. Neighborhood. And so I was meeting some of the other guys through the guys I knew from my neighborhood. And my cousin, who is um, now deceased, he was a member of Prime Suspects okay. with No Limit. And okay. his name is Skanu. And, you know, um, rest in peace to Skanu. But he, he kind of talked me into, it was a combination of him, KL, Mia and Cain and Abel that kind of got me to No Limit. They were trying to get you. So and if I missed out anybody, I'm those, sorry, those we just didn't the mean to. But uh, let me ask you. It seems like Mia be Mia be hustling. Be hustling. We already see that she a hustler. Right. So like, so when you made that decision though, so you had an alternative to go to Cash Money. So because because to me, you know, the new, No Limit thing was big. You know, even before the Cash Money thing took off, of course, um, but. You had choices back then. Yeah, what well, what well, cash money was big locally. Like, See, in I this didn't, region, we we wasn't here. Yeah, in this region they were like, yeah, they dominated this region. Even so, when Body Body was out? Um You see what I I'm saying? I guess both got their fair share around that time because at the time I would say no limit was probably bigger in the Midwest and West Coast okay. at that time when cash money was um Locally, dominating yeah. uh, the local scene and by the time No Limit came down south by the time P came down here to kind of get what eventually became that sound that he's known for um, I was working around working around Cain and Abel Fiend okay. and um, people like that and I did a song with Cain and Abel. That was the very first song I did as a no, uh, before I signed with No Limit. But the very first thing I did with No Limit was a song called God and Guns on Cain and Abel's Seven Sins album. So I met P at their video shoot for Gangsta Fire. And um, once I met him, you know, we, we talked briefly. He was like, man, come to the studio Thursday with KL. And I came and I had never moved back home. So that was kind of. Wow. History after that. So when you think about the music and the way that that, that movement went during the time that it was it, were you guys did y'all tour at that time or was it just y'all were making music and and just staying you know in the inner city or how well, did it when, go? Once I got with once him, you got with them, well limit. when I got with them they was right on the verge of taking off. taking off. Right? Okay, so it was it was great at that time. You know, tours were. I mean, people were calling from everywhere. Everywhere and, trying to get you guys. Yeah, we couldn't we couldn't get enough um, tours. We, we, we probably could have did, we, we probably could have turned down some tours. Some tours. There, was so, there was so many calls for that at that time. And um, it was, it was something, um, it was something to see, man. It was, it was something big. And I was kind of an oddball out because I grew up an East Coast rap fan. What? So I really didn't. I, I really didn't um, listen to a lot of. I would say, to a lot of southern rap at that time. Who was you listening to in the East Coast? Well, you know, I, I grew up a diehard Rakim fan. That's me, so, man. I like so that you know, what that's I mean? a bad and, dude right there. And 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 when you when you grow up a fan of the God, it's kind of it's kind of hard to. It's almost like when you're a 12th grade, it's kind of hard to sit in a sixth grade classroom, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, because you know, they like, lyrical, and I, you know, and, and 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 that's not to say that's not to say about the market. I was just saying certain artists, it was kind of hard for me to uh, just get into if you didn't really have any complexity, because I was attracted to complex stuff. I, I really wasn't into simplicity, and. 
when I decided to make the move to get with No Limit, it was because I felt I would stick out like a sore thumb. Okay, I get you it. See what I, mean? I get it. Because I I needed that something that separated me from anything else, not just on No Limit, but down south in general. And um, that was one of the major factors. Like wow. a lot of my friends who grew up like me, are fans of certain type of artists, they were like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> because if I go on the East Coast and sign with one of those labels, I'll just fall in the That's array right. of artists out there. And, you know, here... I will be the only one that sounds, sounds like, like this. Sound. And that's what I want. So you perfected that sound. Don't know if I perfected it, but <laughs> I worked on perfecting it. Baby. So when you think about like uh, you know, just uh coming up and you end up, you know, basically I know you you hit a bump in the road or whatever mm -hmm. and you had to go and sit down for a while. Like just explain that I guess we can get into that a little bit. I know you over here right. waiting on that. Right. So what happened? Why you got to stir you to off stir the you stir you off, off right. the like I, I we don't know I'm gonna be honest right with you. we basically we haven't heard the story yet. never okay um, before I get into that I want to say this okay I want I want to because um, I had I had a moment to think about some of the artists in the South that I really got listened it. to let's talk about it as far as lyrically um, my favorite artist and because I listened it wasn't that let, I, I let was, me see who it is it wasn't that I was <laughs> adverse okay to a region, I was just more into a certain level of lyrical content. Let me see who your favorite artist so, in the South was. In the South, I would definitely <laughs> say that Scarface I knew was it. one I of- I knew it, I already knew was, it, I seen it, I knew was, that, I could've said it. I, 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 I started to say it. He was the- Everybody said He was that Scott. lyrical- He bad, man, he never that, did a bad verse. Yeah, he was that lyrical dude that I was like, yo, I didn't care what Scarface was talking about. The way he talked about it made me want to listen. <laughs> um, I would say, Bun B always had Bun lyrics. Lyrical. See, I see where he at he was, with his. He was lyrical. Eight ball. Eight ball. MJG too. Ah, uh, you um, can't do that. You not for the lead pimp out. We for to be into oh, it. I'm waiting. No, no. That's what no, I was no, waiting. No, 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 I was, I was waiting. waiting. He, 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 he ain't done yet. Let, let me, I ain't ahead. done yet. I ain't done yet. I like eight ball and MJG. And um, Outcast, definitely. Outcast, Outcast were. Outcast kind of made me proud of the South. I just like Andre. Yeah, they, they, yeah, she always <laughs> say that. Yeah, they they um they made me proud of the South lyrically. Um so I would catch Goody Mob. Goody Mob loved Goody, Goody Mob. Goody Mob's good. They were another group that made me proud of the South. And believe it or not, believe it or not, um Mystical. Mystical bad, man. But I can't really speak on them because we was on the same label, so I love I, I love a lot of them. He did I, I I'll seem biased if I mm. talk about um the people on the label. Juvenile. Juvenile was dope. What people Still didn't dope. give P Juvenile um, credit his for, style. his style was so unique that I don't, him and Mystical, I, I think that their styles were so unique that they didn't really get the credit I felt they deserved for their lyrical content. You see what I'm saying? Fiend, another artist that I think that his style was so unique that it kind of went over your head that Ain't that was dope. real lyricism. But y'all was hogging the game during that time. I, it, it's not uh, fair, bro. It's like that time. It was it was phases where it wasn't nothing else going on. All the music was dropping with no limit, man. Yeah, and and finally, I really this is this is this was because I had guilty pleasures too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. didn't listen to all lyrical. You know, I always had that artist. I just did. I didn't want to think. I always had that artist who I just liked to hear. And that would be Pimp C. He was different. I just liked Pimp's voice, and I liked his tracks. I really didn't care what Pimp was talking about. His voice and his tracks was just fire. I mean, that sweet John, he just yeah, had that sound. But, it, and it the production. Was, he produced that's, that's what I mean, yeah, the tracks. Yeah. The tracks were just dope, and he just had that voice. Wow. So that was one of my guilty pleasures. It was like, it really didn't matter. I just like it. I can't lie, man. Scarface is one of those dudes. You mentioned him first. His lyrics and the way he ride beats, man, it's just, it, it's a difference the way he come in. I used to tell dudes all the time because they would say, Jay-Z this, Jay-Z. I said, nigga, you bring Jay-Z, I'm going to bring Scarface, and I promise you he going to know what it is. 
I just know what type of dude Scarface is. He's not fit to go in there and play with nobody. I don't care who it is. It was Pac. He was going in there serious. Mm-hmm. It, you would not fit to out just whatever he doing. He going to do it to the max. And it's a problem. But, like, you got to bring it. But that's that's a true artist. I mean, when you... in, I, I like to feel I'm the same way. If I get on your song, man, I'm coming. <laughs> I, ho- I really hope that you... Um, I really hope you do your due diligence. And I really hope that you... You prepared, cause I mean I'm gonna do me. All right, now give us the give us right. the spiel. So on, now on America, everything we get, we get America. We're gonna get to the story. Yeah, we are gonna get the to the spiel. story. The the spiel, the the the, the, right. the 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 crash out, I guess. What? But usually, like even when I crashed out, when I did things where I, it made me to where I had to stop and look at my car, it helped me so much, bro. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I know it sounds crazy, mm-hmm. Sit, sitting in those courtrooms, whatever I had to do to do what I had to do. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't change a thing because I wouldn't be who I am right now sitting at this table, bro. I think I feel the same way. And um, I, don't, I say that unapologetically that we all have that road that we take in life and your road defines you. And because the road defines you, it would be idiotic to not um, embrace and it. And, and be thankful for that road because that road defines you. Correct. I agree. So, <clears throat> with that being said, um, around 1997, you know, once I got with No Limit or whatever, we, we were traveling. Everything was doing, everything was, was great at that time. You know, financially, if for a young man, I was able to purchase a home and do a lot of stuff for my family that I dreamed of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because we kind of... We grew up, I won't say poor, because I used to say poor, but as a mature, a, a, a mature adult, I feel that the word poor is misused by, um, by many of us because there are countries where there are people that are really poor that have to walk miles to get clean water. So, um, you know, just because I may have had this pair of shoes and not that pair of shoes doesn't mean we were poor. There are people that really don't have any food to eat. And some people say, well, we got this beans and rice on the shelf. Well, you have beans and rice. There are some places that don't have have beans beans and rice. rice. So I I don't like to uh, misuse that word poor. But we grew up with, I would say, um, we grew up lacking in in, in some things. But we had essentials. You know, we we had a roof over our head. We had food on our um, table. We had clothes on our back. May have not been the best at times, but... You know, the dream is always to do better for your family. So I was blessed at 20, 21 years old to be able to take care and provide for my family. Dope. And I felt proud. Um, I think somewhere along the line in my immaturity at 21, 22 years old, I neglected um, to really get responsible about those variables. And I always allude to those variables because it's those things that I think we overlook, that we see, that's going on around us, particularly when they involve the people we love or friends. We overlook little things, and those little things add up. You know, it might be a little speck of dust here, but in about two months, it might be a pile of dirt. So we overlook it, we overlook it. And um, I think that for me, I got to a point where I was moving so... Um, freely and, and, and swiftly in my life I got comfortable and I think I neglected to uh, check those those variables right because being an, an artist believe it or not is um, it's a business being an artist is a business the artist is a business and a lot of artists don't see themselves that way and even in the, the 90s a lot of us, we didn't see our individual selves as a business. Yeah, back then it was different than what it right. is now. Right, and when you when you're a businessman and you see yourself as a business, it's, it's sort of like a, a a lyric that Jay Z said: "I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man." And when you see yourself that way, then you're gonna protect that business, and you're gonna make sure that okay, everything is proper, everything is in order. And, and that's what you should do. Well, I think that because in my immaturity, I didn't, um, 
I didn't micromanage everything and everybody. And when you have certain elements in your surroundings, you have to be aware of them. And if they are not constructive, then they can only be destructive. But how can you micromanage everybody? Because especially it depends on how many people you have around you. Right. It's not possible for it's, you. To it's do. impossible. Right. So that once again goes to knowing yourself and keeping even that in check, not having everybody around you, as mm-hmm. many people around you. So, and, 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 and let me say for the record that I don't think that any of the people around me had nefarious intent with me. It was just those variables that we failed to keep in check and keep, right. you know, keep things in order. So with all of that being said, it led to, it culminated in the night of February 20, um, 2000. I was actually arrested on the 21st, but everything happened on February the 20th. It was um, a party that I went to that my mom gave. It was, it was an event that she gave to to uh, showcase some artists from that area that we um, threw the party in. And I had just came from off uh, a tour. I went to it. I was My job was to come make an appearance, to draw the crowd, sign some autographs, and uh, roll out. Much of my family was there with me at this place. My dad, my mom, aunts, uncles, cousins. It was a gang of us in this place. And uh, somewhere after midnight, a fight broke out between one of my cousins and some people uh, and some guy in the club. Well, this fight resulted in the shooting death of one of these young men. And I left the place and went home. Went home not knowing if someone was even shot because I would later learn that someone someone was actually shot and subsequently died. I would later learn that when the police arrived at my my uh, my house. So you left before the altercation or you no, left No, I left during, during the during altercation. The during the yeah. altercation. Because I heard a gunshot. But okay. I didn't look to see if somebody was shot. Oh, okay. You see gotcha. what I'm saying? Gotcha. I just heard a gunshot, rolled out. And um I didn't know if I didn't know who was shooting or if in fact I was the target of the shooter. Of course. I didn't know. So I, my my main concern was my mother, so I, I went towards the front door looking for moms because uh, she was collecting the admission fee, and she wasn't there. I would learn about 10 seconds later she was in my truck okay. waiting on me. Wait, she hadn't wait. left. Wow. <laughs> so we left, and um, we headed home. When I got home, the guy who was at my house babysitting my two youngest siblings had told me that the, detectives, uh, the St. Tammany detectives had called and wanted to question me about a shooting. It was at that Dang, moment. that's quick. It was at that moment. But we're talking about 45 minutes okay. from where the place was to my house. And uh, that was at that moment that I learned that there was an actual shooting, shooting. and that somebody and was somebody shot. Had died. No, I, they hadn't died yet. Okay. So I had learned that there was a shooting. So by the time I was taken to the interrogation room, which was about a couple hours later, um, during the interrogation, the detective got somebody walked in the room and whispered something in his ear. And it was after that, he told me that this is no longer uh, an assault investigation. It's a murder. Wow. And so I was like, man, because the whole time I was in the, the interrogation room, my thought was like, man, I hope this person lives. Yeah, of course. Because if they live, they're going to be able to tell them who shot them. Shot them, that's right. And um, when they didn't, man, I just, I was like, I, I, I knew that. Where it was like, I knew that this, it everything pointed towards me. This just looked funny. But it's yeah. crazy because you know? when you're at a place where you have so many people around, you would think that everybody, there's a lot of eyewitnesses. Everybody right. can say who did and what. There were, and, so. and there were. Um, any witness that, that basically made any statements in my favor were um, silenced, pressured, wow. threatened. Um, and every, uh, every, anybody, who, anybody who said anything that remotely sounded like there was a possibility of me, all of a sudden became 100% sure it was me. 
And you, you know, think that you were targeted because you were a public figure? Initially, no. No, initially, I think that, well, let me say this. I'm an optimist, right? So I like to believe that people, um, I like to think that most people are doing what, are doing, or their initial approach is what they think is right. Yeah. Right? So I felt that initially, they thought they were going to investigate the right person because I pulled a gun out in the club Okay, when I okay. heard the shot. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then I ran toward the door looking for my mom. So, so they I, thought think that, that, yeah. I think that witnesses told him he had a gun. And he was, was running. You know, so I think that when they came to get me, they thought they was arresting the right person. Mm-hmm. But somewhere in between the interrogation room and the, um, so at some point during the interrogation, I believe that they realized they had the wrong person. Wow. And that's when the devil in the details showed his face. Of course. I think then it was like a matter of we have a famous person who has been broadcast all over world news that um, they've shot someone. And we are the ones who have given the information that this is the perpetrator. So they're covering her, we behind. cannot go back and look stupid on the world stage saying that we arrested the wrong guy. Mm-hmm. So now what we got to do is we have to basically do what is necessary to stick these charges to him, no matter what, because this is bigger than him. This is about our department looking like it knows what it's doing. This is about the public having confidence in our department. Yeah, you know what I mean? Was it a DA or something that was definitely working on this case? It had to be one DA that was. Yeah, the DA uh, name is, is Walter Reed at the time. He is now a convicted felon. He just got out of mm. prison like, um, I think last year. He was released early because of COVID. What was he convicted for? Um, wiretap fraud, a uh, couple other things. He was shaking different entities down in the in the area. They were paying him. That's How okay. does that weigh on the cases that he, 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 you know? Well, I think it should weigh heavily, but, right. you know, this is a real... Um, it's a real heavyweight that you, you would have to be going up against. Um, the sheriff who spearheaded the investigation, which led to my arrest and subsequent conviction, is now a convicted felon. He was um, wow. He was convicted last year. He has four life sentences. Mm, um, four. The charges include rape, molestation, dating back to the seventies, incest, um, yeah, and the like. Ain't that something? Wow. Mm-hmm. They should they should pull up back every single case that they all of these people it. tried. They won't. They won't do it because it, they know it would it would open the doors and it would make um it would make their department look the, the justice system not just. But yeah. it's already making them look a certain way for the, for these people to even get convicted for anything. But see, it looks that way momentarily. And they know that the average person That's attention right. span is so short. Oh, he got messed over, then it's gone. It's not it's in the gone. news no more. If it's not in the news no more, it's dead. So the 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 the, the thing is, I don't I don't really blame those individuals as much as I blame us, the public, who entrust these these individuals and who have a chance to vote and we vote for these individuals. Because they may align for different reasons, multiple reasons. They might be our family. They might be our neighbor. But when we're giving them or we're voting someone in a job with the public trust that is as important as the district attorney's office, we need to be certain that this person is just. But at the same time, if the information of them not being just isn't out there and they put on that face to make it seem like we can trust them and we don't know that we cannot. How can we vote otherwise if we don't know? Right. And that's a good point. But I would say 
and, and I try to be as politically as correct as I can possibly <laughs> be. But I'm going to just be raw. Go they ahead. Be, they be knowing these people. Yeah. Bottom line, these people be political allies. It's a these good old boy be, system. Yeah, these people be aligned with them um, in their political views, and they don't care about if their um, their views are, 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 I would say, hurtful to people outside of our clique. It doesn't matter. Yeah, he does that. I don't care. I don't like them anyway. But Mac, so. how, how much time did they like give you? When, and mm-hmm. I, I, cause we didn't get to that part, but and I, I didn't mean to cut you off. But I'm just trying to figure out like when they convicted you. Yeah, and, I was convicted and, and, and of you, manslaughter. And you, you had to. Did you cop a plea? You had to. No. How, they gave you. The judge gave you. Yeah, you I was innocent. Of you said I'm innocent all, all the way, way to through. the end. All the way to the end. Just like yeah. I, the jury. I was actually charged with murder. I was facing a life sentence. But the jury came back in yeah. their deliberation with a manslaughter verdict. And a manslaughter in Louisiana carries zero to 40. I was given 30. And, um, and you tried appealing and all of that? Yeah, I tried yeah, everything. Up everything going, was denied. 20, 21 years, 21 years. and uh, I was pardoned by the governor, by Governor Edwards. So wow. thank but you, all, Gov- America. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Governor Edwards. Yeah, was, uh, but, but after man. all of that, one thing I wanted to know, because a lot of people, when you think about being wrongly convicted, and that you are there. How angry were you when you were in prison? And how long did it take for you to get over that anger? Um, the weird thing is, um, I probably was angry momentarily. Really? Momentarily. When I first got in that, that cell, there were a few things that I prayed for. It was, it was a couple things that I prayed for. And I'm not I'm not a big religious person, but I do pray. Um, I, well, I have prayed, and I do. Um, one of them, the main thing was that I didn't want to become black-hearted. I didn't want to become black-hearted. Um, that was the main thing. And, you know, I didn't want to be bitter mm-hmm. because I have, I have seen what happens to bitter people. Yeah, she don't, she so don't um, my question to you is Why you were in prison Were you angry um, Because anybody in their right mind Wrongly convicted Would be angry out of their mind um, While they're in there And if you were How long did it take you to get over it All right. Initially if I, w- I, was, I was very angry initially Okay You know but I deal with anger um, Differently Differently I, I deal with it Internally, you know, I try and I try my best not to um, display anger. Okay. I just kind of deal with it inwardly, and it's painful. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm not a big religious person, but I do pray. And one of the things, and most important things, I prayed for while incarcerated was I I, I prayed, you know, just to not be black hearted. I didn't want to be um, bitter. bitter. I didn't want to be mad at the world because. You know, bitter is self-consuming. I mean, bitterness is self-consuming, and I, I didn't want to be that person that's just mad at the world because of what happened to me. Did you have children at that time? Yes, my my son's mother was was six months pregnant when I was arrested. Wow. So by the time I was convicted, my son was one, almost two. Oh, so you were able to see him being born? No. Oh no. Okay, you were no. Right. When okay. I was arrested, she was six months okay, pregnant. Okay, because I didn't know if you came out on so, bond or anything. No, like I that. never. They you never. never they denied bond. Everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. In fact, um, just to just to back up, ten days after my arrest, the person who actually did it confessed to it. He went to the officers and he confessed to it and, and told him he did it and to told prison? him why. Yeah, they they said that um, they had reason to believe. They and never, he was lying. They never. They never presented these reasons. But they had reason to believe that he was um, compensated for his confession mm. by me, by me, and no limit. Mm, mm, mm. It's like, what can you? And me and my lawyer, our argument was, what can you pay a man to go spend the rest of his life in prison? That doesn't right. even make any sense. We're not talking about this is my weed or this is my. Um, stolen goods I'm I'm you know that's for me that's not for them no we're talking about a person who confessed to killing an individual so what did he say as the reason why he confessed he said the guy broke a bottle 
and rushed him with the bottle and he said he shot him. So he's looking at self-defense. And that was part of the reason they said that he was lying. Their, their, their argument was that he's not only trying to get me off, he's trying to get, get himself left. off. Right. And I was like, I have never heard of anything like this before. And um, he confessed three times. Lie detectors, they didn't try to do a lie detector? They probably did. But they also did a test on my hands for gunpowder residue. And found none. It, it found none, and the test kind of came up missing. Okay. You, you, you get convicted. You, now you say the anger is not really just there, but then you get to go, you go to Angola. Where, where do you go to prison? Well, I went to, um, I spent most of my time at Elaine Hunt Correctional okay. Center. But when I left the parish jail, they sent me up north to um, Concordia Parish uh, facility, and then I stayed there for two years. Left there, went to um, Fort Wade, which is further up north. And I did like two weeks there because I had to go through processing. And then they sent me to a place called Winfield. I did two and a half years at Winfield. And then I was sent back down south to Elaine Hunt. And that's where I spent like 15 years at Elaine Hunt. I think I went to Angola for a week to get my two pulled. Wow. And um, I just just tried my best to make um, the best of my time in prison. I tried not to wallow in the, the sorrow, sorrow. Of, of what happens and and I think uh, I think you know a lot of it has to do with just my upbringing I, I just was never uh, we, my parents didn't raise us to be victims you know and and as painful as the situation was for me I always tried to see the, the good in it or tried to see if not the good in it see a light at the end of the tunnel and then there were people around me who were in situations that I felt were far more worse than mine like there was a guy who I was um, incarcerated with at Hunt. He had been locked up 46 years for a rape that he didn't commit. He's out now. He was, um, they found DNA evidence to let him out. And, you know, it, it's this man is in his 60s. Wow. But in a case has, like that and they found DNA evidence and to let him go, he did he go back and sue the city? Well, if I am not mistaken and don't quote me on this, Louisiana has like a two hundred thousand dollar or something cap on what you can get for a wrongful conviction. That's it. That's yeah, it. Yeah, they make sure that you you can't really get nothing. And unfortunately, the people that wrongfully convict you are not held accountable. Do mm. you, was this before the C murder thing? It, it had to be yeah, before. Yeah, mine was like a year and a half before. So, what but with but C. they started they started rolling those around the same time though the same way. When I say thinking of it, you dealing with the same court system. No, I okay, was cool. dealing with St. Cool. Tammany Parish. He was dealing with Je- uh, Jefferson Parish. Okay, cool. Which are not the same, but they are. You got no limit. They and, are they, and, they, and they they all, you, these all rub shoulders. You right. know that, right? And, right, and these are the two most, these are two of the most conservative parishes in Louisiana. Wow. Mm. Did you guys so, do time together? You and C? Yeah, in fact, I did, uh, the last couple of years I did at Elaine Hunt, C was there with me. Cool. Well, how how is he doing? And, you oh, know. He's, he's doing good. You know, C a fighter. Yeah. He, he, he's never going to give up his pursuit of freedom, and he shouldn't, you know, yeah. because he was done wrong. And, and, you know, they know he was done wrong. Just like in my situation, I think in, in situations like ours, they don't, it don't even be about the money for them. It's like what they can, um, the, the the point they can prove is far more important than to them than what money you can spend with them as far as on lawyers and, and stuff like that. They use us, I think, to <coughs> force, uh, to to spread this I'm tough on crime message. Mm-hmm. Here goes one of your heroes, and I'm gonna show you that if he if if he get in trouble. I'm going to do him so seriously to make sure that none of y'all can think that. It's sort of right. like they use us as deterrents. Yeah. So do exactly. you, so you said spirits is good. So that's a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, just the conversations. He's been gone now for years, man. Yeah. How long has he been gone? Like 20. 20. Got, like I was in there 20. Yeah, about 20. 21, so he yeah, did, 20. I did 21. 
He's about right at 20 now. Wow. And you say you weren't bitter in prison, but how was he? How was, was his spirits? He, was he bitter like in the beginning stages well, when you... I'm pretty sure he went through the same um, stages we went through because we all, I think everybody, and, and you can probably yeah. attest to that, we all, you know, in, in the you beginning... You feel like you got done wrong. Yeah, you, 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 you know, you're mad. You feel like, man, how could this happen to you? Yeah. You know, that were times I questioned God. Of like, course. Yo, like, man, how, how could you let this happen to me? Yeah, yeah. You know, but... It eventually was like, okay. I got to the point where I was like, all right, now this prison could be hell for you or it can be college campus. It's mm -hmm. up to you. You make it what you want it to be. And I chose to make it my college campus. And I chose to learn and to um, do you whatever went to I can do. While yeah. You were in there? yeah, I want to do everything that was constructive, anything that can help me get in a better situation. And I like to win, I don't like to lose. So when I was um, when I was there, I kind of started paying attention to the guys who were in similar situations as mine and who were getting free, and I just started following the trail they left. Because in prison, freedom is a win. So I don't like to lose. So I went to paying attention to them and just following that path that they was doing. So all of the other foolishness that people was doing to let out that anger they felt, that bitterness they felt, I mean, it wasn't helping you. It wasn't doing nothing, you know, other than telling people how you feel. And what's the feeling? And you, you, feel, that you, you seem to be very humble and laid back type of person. But I know that, you know, I've heard a lot of stories from people who've been in prison. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of violence and gangs of violence. and all of that. Yeah. How were you able to survive during all of that and not being able to, were you involved in any of those? Because from what I hear, when you go, it's almost like you have to check in, you have to almost pick a side, all of that sort of things. Did that affect you when you went to prison? No. And how come? Um, prison is a weird place. Um, yeah, that is a true statement. America, prison <laughs> is a weird place. All right, so you have different uh, prisons all over the country. And right. in Louisiana, we don't really, gangs aren't really big in Louisiana oh, prisons. Okay. Um, Louisiana has figured the prison thing out, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. See, when you isolate people, and, and put them in a certain group, you almost kind of validate their gang. See, uh, Louisiana don't do that. I'm about to stick all y'all in this dome. And guess what? You're going to have to get along with each other. All y'all killers. So guess what? There is a unspoken code of respect because everybody know the potential danger of the next man Okay, it makes it makes a lot of sense. We're in an open dome, no cells. Fifty man tank or hundred and twenty man oh. warehouse with just beds in it. Mm. So you're not about to blah 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 and go to your cell and go, and to, go sleep. to sleep mm -hmm. because there ain't no walls to separate us. Wow! You threaten someone, tell them you're gonna do them this that. You and can't the other, close your eyes, and then you wake up in the middle of the night and he's standing over your bed. Right. So. It was like a, that's why I say Louisiana, this prison thing. They got to figure it they out. They figured it out. So you had, some guys don't care. You know, you had violence. But if you mind your business and you did the right things in prison, I learned early on that you were able, I was able to evade much of the foolishness. Because the foolishness in prison centered around three things. Gambling, drugs. I'm gonna try to say this in the most political correct <laughs> way. He tried to find he, it right. He failed me. Yeah, um, I know exactly what it is. The other thing, I was just saying that. <laughs> That's yeah. what. The, yeah. The other okay. thing. So yeah. those three things are what most of the violence centers around in prison. Yeah. And if you are not involved. In one of those three things, it's a good chance that your prison stay will be as um, bearable okay. as possible. That's what because I don't want to say smooth. I don't want to say smooth. good because nothing is good about you. Prison. Can run nothing into any situation. And you can run into any situation. You'll have your bumps in the road, but 
if you can avoid those things, it'll be bearable. He pretty much said, mind your business. Mm. Yeah. And, Simply say it. And, and, and that's basically <laughs> it. It's mind all your it business. Is. But did you end up having to cut off a lot of family when you got out? Because, you know, sometimes you'd be gone so long, and you would think that a lot of people would be down for you and hold you down while you're gone, but you realize who is really your friends, who is really your family, who is, you know what I mean? Did you have that problem so that when you came home, your circle that you had became a lot smaller? No. Um, I started by saying I'm an optimist, right? I don't see things that way. I don't think anyone owed me anything. God, that's your time. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you I was given that. Been, I was always that type of child from a, from a, a child who just. I take my response. I take me. I'm my responsibility. Nobody else. I agree right? with that. And because so, I don't expect much from people. And um, I'm never disappointed mm -hmm. because I don't have those expectations. I got to ask you this before we get off here. BG, did you ever get to do time with BG while you was gone? No, he was in the feds. Oh, yeah, 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 he was. Yeah. Yeah. I seen, I'd seen him before he went to the feds. He's been gone about, 12, about 15, 15 years. Yeah, years. yeah. Yeah, man, it's it's like a lot of a lot of rappers, man, catch mm -hmm. it. You know, it's a, it's almost like it's a target, not just through the judicial system, but oh, it within, was. It, within themselves, within the hip hop police. It's all kind of stuff it geared was. toward it, man. It, it was. I mean, and, and and make no mistake about it. And, and let me say this, and, and just for the records, before we go, I want, uh, I don't ever want to come across as downplaying this experience or downplaying the injustices that are that exists within our uh, judicial system, within our criminal justice system, and, um, and within law enforcement. I don't ever want to come across as um, downplaying the, 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 the enormity of how it negatively affects our communities, certain groups our people, of people, culture. right? Certain, certain cultures, right? So that stuff is real. But just on an individual level, on a personal level, I feel that every person is in control of their destiny. And the way you see the world, the way you perceive it is what, um, is what it is. Because we all define our own reality. Two people can look at the same thing. And guess what? Depending on how they view it, I mean, the way they, how they Perception feel about it. Perception is everything. Perception is everything. If my partner and another guy get into a fight, this dude can beat the crap out of my partner. If I don't like the dude, I'm gonna say, man, my partner was 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 hurt already. He, right. uh, I'm gonna find a reason why Justified. my partner was in in the right. Just, mm -hmm. My all my partner can punch down a 80 year old dude, and if you like your partner and you're on that end of it, you're gonna the, the average person will be like, well, man, he shouldn't have did this or he did that, and that's what made you know because people just see things with their heart, not their eyes. But when you came home. You weren't able to file any lawsuits or anything like that. No, because no. I wasn't exonerated. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. D just you know, what do you plan to do now? What's what's the what's the game? What's the end game now? What's the what's the end thing that you are going to take care of, Mac? Like to what, oh man, what are we doing? All right, the end game is to have peace of mind. <laughs> that is the end game. I think that everything we do and we pursue in life is to try to get us a peace of mind. That's it. So um, for me. I love mentoring. Okay. So what I do now is I have a uh, I, I work with kids with a certain organization with two organizations actually, and one of them is an after school program where you know we we do a lot of workshops for kids, teaching them, just trying to give them the opportunities that didn't exist when we were kids. Mm -hmm. um, another organization, and that one is called Yep, the Youth Empowerment Project. Another organization I work with is called um, Son of a Saint. It's for fatherless boys. Okay. Good. And um, I, I, I'm passionate about that one because through mentoring in prison, one of the things that I realized was about 80% of the young men that came to my class um, that were under the age of 23 was fatherless. Was fatherless. Mm hmm and these were all prisoners. These were all young men between 18 and 23 years old, and 80% of them were fatherless. In fact, I used to ask every class, it might be 30 people, I'd be like, yo, how many of y'all got a father in your life? Three of them might raise their hand. Mm -hmm. So I realized early on that, you know, 
I, I realized in the neighborhood as a kid that there was something different about me and my friends who did have their father and the guys who didn't. Mm-hmm. I want to, uh, I, I guess I'm gonna I'm, I'm end it, but just as far as Manny Fresh, as far as Master P, as far as all these known name mm-hmm. people, what are some, did, did, have you spoken to them since you've been home? And mm-hmm. basically, like, like, what is those conversations like? Oh man, is it, it's it just love for me. For me, with anybody, it's just it's, it's just a mutual respect. Okay, for me. you know, it, it's when I first got out, man, he took me out to eat. Dope, you know what Dope. I mean. That's so, the kind yeah. of stuff I'm into. Yeah. Cause I, when you get out, the first day out is serious for me. Because everything <laughs> changed. Everything is not it's, the same right. anymore. What has changed so much? That's another thing. Like, what was oh, the man. biggest? Dip, it's always cell phones. Cell phones it's like, always cell phones. That social media, man. And look, the, yeah. the phones were flipping when I left. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you can chirp on them. Yeah. Man, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> My wife had to take care of the phone for me. Like social media, I have people be seeing me. They be like, "Man, I DM'd you." What's a DM? How right. does that work? In fact, I was so, um, I was so computer. Uh, I guess computer illiterate. computer illiterate. No, well, I'm gonna say social media. Social illiterate media illiterate. That my wife had to tell me that Willie D has sent me a message after I did the podcast with them. And I had to shout out Willie D. I had to uh, just shout out to Willie D. Man, yeah, I enjoyed my time there. And what's so crazy is I had to message him and Scarface to tell them that I just realized what I was doing, <laughs> and Willie just hit me back with a bunch of uh, crying laughing emojis because <laughs> I was like, man, I I don't know what I'm doing, man. I, I, I didn't even know how to check this, you know. So, so did you even have you didn't did you know them guys personally when you left? You didn't know those guys, did you? No. Correct, but when you came home, they reached out to you because of your. They know yeah, your story. story. Yeah, the story. They are, and, and and you know, I mean, I grew up fans of the Ghetto Boys, so it of was, course, me it too. It was a no brainer when they were like, you know, the Ghetto Boys want you on your podcast. Like, like I'm going over there. there. So, you come to Dallas too. We bring you up to Dallas. Yeah, I gotta show you some love. Some. In fact, I think what was the 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 best thing that I um, well one of one of the highlights of of my um, my time there at that podcast because it wasn't the best. It was a lot of things I enjoyed. But I asked Face uh, once we finished. You had your I own fan him, moment, didn't you? Yeah, I told him. <laughs> I told him. Um, I said, "Man, I know you play instruments." I said, "Let's jam." So we just. I grabbed the bass. He grabbed the guitar, and we just jammed out. That's we dope. Really, wow. We ain't really. I don't even really recorded that. Me. A lot of people. It was just for me. A lot of people want, don't know that Scarface is is so into the right. producing. Right. You know, Mr. Lee talked about that on our show. Yeah. He was like, "Man, Scarface," because they get they play golf together. They golf mm-hmm. big golfers. And he was like, man, Scarface good at golf, but man, people don't know he hell he can produce, man. Mm-hmm. You know, like that. he can rap, but he got so many attributes to him. Right. That's dope, man. How did that make you feel to work to, to jam out? Oh, with? man, was cool. I just wanted to be able to tell my grandkids we jam, man. You know I mean? So, I, so. I, how how is it like going on that podcast? I, I see him. I love their movement. But Willie D was already doing stuff. He, mm-hmm. I think he's like he pulled pulled Scarface into it in my right. mind because right. he was always Willie D was on it early on. Well, Willie was always Willie has always been outspoken. Yeah, and those kind of people, um, people like Willie D, are gonna always be leaders in the community because they are they are unapologetic and unafraid, and and those are the kind of people that we need as leaders in our community. Well, let me tell you something. Being from Texas, man, them boys right there, they they made us look a different way. We look, we. I, I felt my spirit through them guys, like because mm-hmm. they were known from Texas. It's like, yeah, we from Texas. It meant something right. when you seen Willie D and when you seen Scarface and when you seen Jay Prince, man. Mm-hmm. You know, like we knew that we were special, and and that that helped us. Like even I know P he and y'all y'all impacted down here. So and we so close, man. The boot right by Texas, so it's Texas, it's Texas to Louisiana, Louisiana to Texas. I told you where I'm from. Man, I'm like, five miles from Louisiana. I like how big the houses is in Texas for the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See out That's here, awesome. man. See out there, you can get a big house That's for true. a couple of dollars, and it look nice. It's very it nice. nice and spacious. So, the land is spacious. Yeah. So, that man, thank like you for Texas. coming on our show, man. Um, man, did like we I leave said, anything out? Is everything? I think we. Uh, How did we do? We let him. Oh, y'all do did it. great. We y'all let him great. do it. Yeah, uh, y'all, he y'all, done it. Y'all did great. Now <laughs> me, 
America, I didn't do too well. Man, please, man. But You're I so enjoyed dope, it man. so much. I'm, your spirit is so, it's dope, man. And I hope when you come to Dallas, you're going to come by our set so you can come yeah. to our, yeah, we'll, our actual we'll location, it. man. And we'll set all that up, too. Yeah, we'll we'll do get that. his number in exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going yeah, to bring y'all both the, up. I'm like, y'all got to come to my yeah, spot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show, sure. Mac, no man. Problem, it's been a man. blessing to it. meet you yeah, on, our, on our anniversary, man. On your anniversary. And happy <laughs> anniversary to y'all. If I'd have had a piano, he'd have a piano. That's all right. We're going to get you. We gonna get. You. Uh, okay. So are you going to be doing like shows and doing little things? Yeah, yeah. Y'all see me. Oh, and before I go, let me make sure I say this. I have a new album coming out. That's what I'm talking about. Memorial Day. It is called Son of the City. So, so you got to come to Dallas, man, yeah, at some point. You yeah, got to gotta market yourself now. Yeah. You're through the East. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't know how to use that thing, man. You got well, to publicist for that. That's yeah. what she's going to do. She's going to have to get it. And, and, but when y'all marketing and y'all come on the show, when y'all debut, when is it coming out? Memorial, Memorial Day. Day. That's a day. That's, right. that's, that that's, that's coming up, man. Yeah. Yep. You excited? Am I? This is like, this album is. Like um, a comeback. Well, this album is a dream come true for me. It's real wow. personal, and it's uh, it's it's finally me doing it the way I've always wanted, wanted to, to do it. it. Can't wait to hear it. Thank yeah. you so much, man. You're a blessing, man. We uh, love you here on Boss Talk 101. Uh, thank you all, Boss Talk. Man, um, you family now. You can't get out of it. Yeah, well, you know. You got to meet the kids and everybody I'm else. I'm one of them family members that kind of show up and be like, what y'all got to eat? We going to feed you. Oh, She's Jamaican, Jamaican, man. Jamaican Come on, man. Oh, Stop right. playing, man. Yeah. Say, man, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101 where the bosses talk. And we out. And we out.